know, when you go to the doctor's office, just for something as simple as a checkup, you have to sign in and then you have to wait a while, 20, 30 minutes, more. You read a magazine, you listen to your iPod, anything to kill the time, and it's usually a pretty long wait. But there's a lot of people that wait a lot longer than you and I do for a checkup, and it's for something much, much more important. You feel sort of hollow and, you know, is anyone going to come along? Sally Sattel knows what it's like to wait for new life in the form of a kidney transplant. She thought she'd found a donor several times, but one after another fell through. One was a close friend. I thought she was going to, to do it. She thought she was going to do it, but oddly she was actually talked out of it by a friend of hers who was a transplant surgeon. The waiting continued until a rather unexpected someone came forward. I think I'd only seen her maybe five or seven times in person. We weren't really close. She ran into a mutual friend. I said, so how's Sally? And she went, uh, well, she's all right, which is obviously, she's not all right. And I go, oh my goodness, what's, what's up? And within three days, she wrote me an email that in the subject line said, serious offer. I said, you know, I hear that you need a kidney and if I'm compatible, you know, I'd be willing to be a donor for you. In 2006, Virginia Postrel gave Sally her right kidney. And now she's my heroine. Unfortunately, happy endings like this are pretty rare. I've died three times, actually. But they kicked me out of heaven. They didn't want me there. My grandpa sent me back one time. My cousin sent me back the other time. The other time, my dad gave me CPR because I had a seizure right there on the floor. Like 75,000 other Americans, Christina de Leon doesn't have a living donor. I don't dwell on it. I'm like, well, if it happens, it happens. Just do what I can while I'm here. <laughs> like so many others, she's on a waiting list to get a kidney from a dead person. I've been on the list since 2003, so how long is that? Three, four, five, six, seven, six years almost. The emotional effect of me waiting, really, I just get tired, you know, sometimes. Just get tired, but then what can you do about it? What can we do about it? Since becoming a donor, Postrel has thought a lot about how to increase the supply of kidneys. There are really a lot of misconceptions about what is involved in kidney donation. The, the biggest one, and one that seems very commonsensical, is that you have two kidneys for a reason. Postrel is an author and former editor of <clears throat> Reason Magazine. You live just as well with one kidney as with two. And the transplant procedure is safer than you might think. We've never had a kidney donor death at our program here. Dr. Gabriel Danovich is medical director of the Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program at UCLA. It's approximately the same as the death rate after having an appendixectomy. But each year, about 3,000 Americans die while on the waiting list. Every year, every day, the list gets larger. Every day, someone like you waits for an organ donation while life passes by. We passed laws. We urge people to become donors. The DMV asks us to become organ donors when we get driver's licenses. Yes. Will you help? Will you help? So much has been tried. But the supply of kidneys still isn't adequate. People. I don't know whether it will ever be adequate to keep up with the number of people because there are so many people in this country with diabetes and high blood pressure and all the other things that set people up to, uh, to develop advanced kidney disease. We've got to find a better way. Otherwise, patients face death or dialysis. It's dialysis time. Come on, get up. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I get up to go to dialysis, you know, 4.30. I snooze till 4.45, and sometimes I get up on time. Oh, God. <laughs> Each session is about four hours long. The dialysis machine cleans Christina's blood, doing the job a healthy kidney would do. Without dialysis, patients would die. With it, they deteriorate slowly. Nearly half won't live eight years. Christina dreams of traveling. Exactly. You can't just go. But the three-day-a-week ritual makes it very hard. You have to call a dialysis center, make sure they have room for you. Some places don't take people who travel. They, don't, they call them um, transients. It's also tough to work full time. I can't work at a doctor's office because they want someone eight to five. They want someone in the mornings. So I can't do that because I have to go to dialysis. With a new kidney, Christina wouldn't have to be tethered to a dialysis machine. You know, so much has been tried to help people like Christina, but there's one thing we can't try because it's illegal. Stay with me paying people to donate their kidneys. I know, it sounds really ghoulish, it sounds really icky, but they're your kidneys, and it really helps people in need, so if you want to sell one, why not? The most 
straightforward approach would be simply to repeal the federal law that makes it a crime to sell organs. But Danovich says that would be a dreadful mistake. Because they don't care about each other. He says money would take the caring out of the donor-recipient relationship. We're going to take the caring out of it, and it's become a matter of paying off people. But Pastrell points out that donors are the only ones in the transplant process who aren't compensated. The surgeons are paid, the people who supply the medicines are paid, the, the people who you know, clean the floors in the hospitals are paid, everybody's paid, uh, but not the donors. But would people be less likely to help others if money were involved? Voluntary donors actually feel good about themselves. A pay donation actually is a subversive uh, uh, process that actually undermines voluntary donation. Think of, you know, soldiers or firefighters. We respect their service, we appreciate their heroism, but we also pay them for their work. Many worry that the poor would be exploited. Who is it that are going to be donors? They're likely to be people whose life has gone poorly and they are in trouble. What if donors use the money to buy a house or pay off debt? Should that concern us? I don't know whether they're paying off a debt for, I don't know, child support. What's wrong with that? Why should we say that poor people aren't allowed to take advantage of being able to be kidney donors? The 2002 movie Dirty Pretty Things depicts a black market organ selling ring in London where the rich simply buy kidneys from the desperately poor. In this scene, an immigrant nearly dies after he exchanges his kidney for British citizenship. He swapped his insides for a passport. Some people sidestep the waiting list in real life by becoming transplant tourists. People who've gone abroad to buy kidneys, there is, by the way, a high incidence of infectious complications. The problem is not that people are getting paid, it's that they're getting defrauded and they're not getting adequate medical care. And this is a huge problem. Lee Crisetta has admitted that he was part of a scheme to steal body parts from corpses. Making something illegal isn't exactly the same as stopping it from happening. More than 1,000 stolen body parts were sold to hospitals for transplants and other procedures. Today, the average wait for a kidney is five years. But that's expected to nearly double as soon as the year 2010. So is there a country where selling kidneys is legal? Well, yes. Iran has a system of paid kidney donation. We don't have a lot of good data, but evidence suggests that many of those donors are very dissatisfied. Yes, well, we usually don't associate Iran with compassionate health care. They don't feel good about themselves. Their lives have not really been improved. The money they got did not really solve their problems. A new study finds problems with the Iranian system, but the author, himself a kidney specialist, also discovered that payment succeeds in a very important way. Iran is the only nation in the world with no waiting list for kidneys. This is one reason that I would want it to happen in the U.S. Pastrell says the U.S. could help people like Christina by combining the payment incentive with our high standards for health care. If you look at the way people are screened to be transplant donors, uh, you would have much better results here. If I was rich, I would. I'd pay somebody in a heartbeat. <laughs> but... That's not my situation. But Pastrell says insurance companies or maybe even the government would pick up the bill. After all, the government already pays for dialysis. This is an enormous expense. The federal government could pay ninety dollars to $100,000 per kidney and still save the taxpayers money. Besides saving a life, you could get paid. If that's the way you have to go to get people off the list because people are not donating, then by all means, pay them, please. What would it be like to have a transplant? God, it would be heaven. But I would be able to sleep late, later than 4 o'clock, you know. I'd be able to eat what I want and drink what I want and travel. You know, I want to go to Indianapolis to visit one of my best friends. And, I mean, it's just, I'd be able to, I guess, it would just be freedom. It would just be freedom. So what do you think? It's not such a horror movie thing after all, is it? How can we end the way for people like Christina and help give them the freedom that they deserve. For Reason.TV, I'm Drew Carey. Thanks for watching.